Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for tuning in and thanks for uh, joining our uh, webinar today um, about roadblocks to digitalization uh, of operations, freight forwarder edition. Um, we are very, very fortunate to uh, being, being joined by a number of very, very high caliber um, speakers, um, which I'll introduce in a, in a minute, um, and which I hope we're gonna have a very, very interesting and engaged, uh, lively uh, discussion around, around this topic. Um, before we start, um, and while we wait for, uh, for, for others uh, to sort of dial in and tune in, uh, maybe we give them um, another, another minute, um, I'd love to ask you um, to participate in our uh, quick poll, uh, which will pop up uh, on the right-hand side um, of, your, of your screen, um, where there's a few questions about um, yeah, your business, your role, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I'd just like to, to do that in order to get to know you better and potentially also ask some more yeah, relevant questions uh, for you guys. Just going to pause here, uh, let you do the poll for, for a second, and uh, yeah. We'll wait for uh, for the rest of the uh, the attendees to to dial in. If you can't see the poll, uh, you might need to click on a button uh, called polls uh, on the the bottom uh, right hand side of your screen um, and there's uh, yeah, three questions three multiple choice questions uh, that you can quickly quickly go through and uh, and vote or answer your answer with your answers <laughs> so to speak Perfect. Then I'd say uh, we get started. Um, once again, uh, for those of you who have just joined, um, you free to participate in our poll on the right hand side. Um, but first and foremost, of course, a very warm, a very warm welcome uh, to our um, webinar. Um, I'll start with what we'll cover today. Um, we're going to talk about um, roadblocks, roadblocks to, to digitalization, uh, especially on the freight forwarder side uh, in the in the operations. Um, we'll talk about industry developments. Uh, we'll talk about factors uh, preventing industry participants, freight forwarders from embracing digital, uh, taking the leap, uh, so to speak, and uh, and 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 yeah, changing changing their their their, their existing uh, processes. Um, we'll hear from um, uh, sort of a number of high caliber speakers about their personal uh, uh, experiences in um, in going digital, uh, in embarking on that on that transformation. And of course, we'll also uh, touch upon a couple of best practices for yeah, uh, changing your 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 operations, uh, changing your business model, embarking on that on that digital journey uh, as well. Um, so we we'll hope that you'll also take away uh, some uh, some best practices and some to dos uh, for you as well. Um, if you have any questions, and I think Valeria also mentioned that on the on the chat on the right hand side, um, please feel free to um, write them in the chat um, as we go. Um, and we'll try to answer them uh, either at the end of the, the session or um, in the meantime, um, if, I, if I see them uh, uh, timely enough, uh, we can also um, pick, pick up on those um, uh, immediately. Um, who, are, uh, who are our panelists today? Um, I mentioned it at the beginning, uh, we're very, very fortunate uh, to have a number of uh, really high caliber speakers with uh, I think a combined uh, logistics experience of uh, of a hundred years uh, uh, or nearly a hundred years um, here in the in the room, um, which uh, which I think will will make for a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, we'll have Biju, um, who is uh, the CEO uh, and CDO, so Chief Digital Officer for uh, Transformation Core. Um, more than thirty years of experience in in, uh, in 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 logistics and freight forwarding, and mostly on uh, sea level uh, and, and and board level. Um, really uh, sort of knowledgeable um, also in terms of uh, what it takes to transform your business, um, what, it, what it takes to um, remain competitive. So very warm welcome, uh, Biju. Um, then we have Thomas, um, uh, who is uh, the VP uh, CIS for Atlas Logistics Network. So 
one of our partner networks um, that we that we work with at, at Exchange and the CEO of uh, the Supply Chain uh, Services Bureau, um, which is a, an advisory firm um, to help uh, logistics businesses implement changes and yeah, uh, adjust uh, to the changing, changing world, uh, so to speak. Then we have Naveen, um, who is the Director of Global Logistics Solutions, um, so really a, a, an actual uh, a practitioner, um, sort of a, not just a practitioner uh, 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 now, but uh, has been uh, over the course of his, his life. Um, deep insights into uh, logistics processes, uh, operations processes, and yeah, uh, what are what are inhibiting roadblocks uh, to uh, transforming them to digital. Um, and I'm really, really curious to hear his his first hand experience on yeah, what makes it uh, difficult or maybe easy to um, change change operations processes. And then we have Jonathan, um, who is our very own uh, CCO, so Chief Customer Officer. Um, at Exchange, um, Jonathan joined uh, around about six months ago. Um, he has uh, more than 10 years of experience in uh, customer excellence uh, and customer success roles uh, across the, the tech universe. Um, so brings in a, a completely different uh, perspective um, and has, 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 yeah, has spent the last six months really uh, getting, getting his head around uh, logistics um, and how he can um, sort of take his learnings from uh, from other industries uh, uh, other digital technologies etc to implement that um, on exchange and um, yeah, his his core role at exchange is really um, working with our uh, customer base uh, to implement an end-to-end -end, um, uh, customer success um, flow uh, from the moment a customer signs up um, gets active um, digital technologies are embedded in customers processes until the until yeah until the end, uh, so to speak. Um, and thanks, uh, thanks, Valeria, for also posting the uh, the LinkedIn profiles of our speakers. This is a is a very good idea, and uh, maybe leads to some some fruitful uh, connections and discussions after after the webinar. Now, um, what I'd like to do, and I mentioned it to the to the speakers already. Um, I, of course, as a as an ex consultant, um, we're very very much addicted to uh, to PowerPoint. Uh, we love we love that stuff, uh, and we'd, uh, we'd, if we could, we spend our day in it. Uh, but uh, for the purpose of this webinar, we said let's let's move away from, the, from this, and let's try to turn this really into a uh, an engaging discussion, um, almost like a whiteboard discussion um, that you only can have when you're um, in a in one room uh, all at the same time, and uh, yeah, sort of have a have a fruitful discussion at the whiteboard. Um, there's these three uh, content blocks that I want to cover industry developments, um, barriers to digital transformation, and moving forward, so a bit of an outlook. Um, and I'll just try to take some notes while our, while our speakers um, speak and give their insights. So without any further ado, um, maybe, uh, would you, uh, we, get, we get started with, with you. Um, I'd love to um, maybe start with just a, just, a, just a look at the past 30 years, uh, your experience, your perspective. Um, how has the industry changed, um, and what has um, yeah what has evolved? What's, what's your perspective? Thank you, Christian. Um, I uh, appreciate uh, and uh, compliment you and your team on the uh, organization of this session. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, when you say uh, thirty years, I got to realize it makes me feel a little old. Although I advertise the fact that I've been in the industry for thirty years, but I started with. Um, I actually started in Australia and then moved to the US. So I've had the opportunity, been fortunate to see the change and the growth in both countries in uh, how forwarding and logistics has evolved. Um, when I first started in the 90s, that was the era of local forwarders. You know, we were, just as background context, that was when we were still working with PCs and we were getting excited about hard drives and the fact that we were able to store 20 gigabytes of information on a computer. And that was when there was local forwarders and we were sending arrival notices and delivery orders by EDI, uh, not by EDI, sorry, by fax machine and taking um, delivery orders down to the local customs office by paper. And that was the era that we operated in. You know, you, if you were lucky to clear 30, 40 shipments a day, um, if that. And today, I think that um, I've seen over the years that evolved into EDI, which was kind of exciting, but it was one-on-one -on -one exchange. And now there is a growing interconnectedness. And if I had to describe one big change that I see, I think it is that aspect of uh, interconnectedness and the growth. 
um, you know, if you had to summarize those trends, it would be global multinational forwarders have gotten larger. I think we've seen the acquisition. I believe that's been enabled by a uh, strong digital presence. You know, freight forwarding is the ultimate network game, isn't it? Everybody is, it's, it's the ultimate network effect at play. And I think it's continued to evolve that way. Uh, you see increasing demand from customers now for generalization. So forwarders aren't just doing forwarding. They're in 3PL, they're uh, connected, they're part of ecosystems. Um, they're expected to provide 3PL. They're expected to be part of a broader supply chain. So if I had to list a trend, trend number one would be growing uh, concentration, globalization, multinational growth through acquisition. Number two would be growing networks. Number three would be greater generalization and participation in supply chains. And then, of course, I don't think we need to state um, overstate the fact that the value of information now has become ubiquitous. It's now you know, freight forwarders that are doing RFPs and RFQs are now responding to more questions about information than they would have in the 90s when it was, what are your capabilities? Today, what are your information capabilities? So if I had to summarize, I hope that's sort of a, sort of a broad brush uh, summary of where I think the industry as a whole has evolved in those 30 years. Yeah, super, super relevant, super, um, yeah. Uh makes makes a lot of sense and i think this is also what we see at exchange the exchange is uh, essentially a, a network focused business right we uh, our, our goal is uh, is not to be uh, a part of any transactions ourselves but really to connect industry participants uh, and make processes smoother so i can i can certainly sign up for sign up for those notions um if we were to sort of look at your your personal uh, experience um uh, sort of in growing growing a business um um, with digital technologies, et cetera. Um, can, you, can you elaborate on some of the digital technologies, initiatives, et cetera, that you have firsthand um, sort of chosen, implemented, et cetera, to grow your business, to grow revenues? Yeah, thanks. Um, I've been fortunate, I, uh, particularly in the 90s and later, I've had the opportunity to work with many companies. Um, and the industry, as I said earlier, has gone through consolidation, multiple rounds of consolidation. So my comments aren't related to any one company, but they're related to broad based um, experience. And where I've observed success and had success, I think, in teams that I've worked with is, first of all, the use of digital to support global acquisitions. I think that the rate at which um, the companies that I've participated in, where there have been major uh, scaling of acquisition growth, I don't think that would have been possible without uh, digital technology. And I think a large part of that comes from the fact that we've been able to use the same system in multiple countries for standardized operations. I can't overemphasize the fact that I think standardizing operations on single global platforms delivers a huge amount of scale and makes acquisitions uh, really easy. So that would be number one for growth. Second, I think um, particularly in the, um, in the early 2000s, what I saw was the growth of online portals and self-service. Um, I think that's, a, that's, that's something that I've been able to capitalize on in my work and in companies that have been, um, uh, that I've been fortunate to work with. The third area would be um, the use of technology for offshoring business processes. Um, I think that's been substantial. And the last one I think would be where we've had success is in documentation and automation of documentation. So RPA, robotic process automation, removing that multiple layers of data entry for the same transaction again and again, I think has been significantly beneficial to help grow the companies. So those would be the four things that I would list if I, if you ask me the question, which you did. So <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. And if you think about sort of today, right? Um, and you think of, uh, about today's market, especially post pandemic, uh, if, if we want to say that we are already post pandemic, if not still in the midst of it, um, what, from your perspective, what are um, the main components that businesses should be focusing on um, when thinking about digital transformation? Um, what, what, what's, what's top of mind for you um, right now? 
So I would recommend, based on uh, successes and failures that I've seen in the industry overall, um, I, I'd focus on five key points, I think, uh, if I had to summarize them. First of all, you just said digital transformation. And I think one of the areas that I would emphasize is less digital and more transformation. Um, I think companies get caught up in technology for technology's sake in the freight forwarding sector. I've been fortunate to have uh, to work with companies that have had leading uh, mindsets when it comes to digital. But in general, I think what happens is it's digital, 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 whereas it's more transformation, transformation, transformation. So I think the first thing I would say is emphasize the transformation rather than the digital and the digital transformation, which leads to a sequence of events. Uh, so, you know, I have a model that I use uh, called the Transcore model or, or framework for thinking about digital transformation. And in that, the first thing I recommend thinking about is the business alignment. I was very interested to hear that in your introductory remarks, Christian, you referred to um, business models and you referred to the uh, to the manner in which business is done and i think this is what people forget is that the idea behind transformation is to actually change the business model how is revenue where is revenue coming from what is the strategy and how is digital driving that so i think number one is business alignment what is the strategy and how is digital going to support that number two is organizational issues um, culture structure, cross-functional teams, the use of um, of smaller, nimble structures. Um, so that would be number two. Number three, I think, is separation of data quality from technology. Um, you know, I, I, I've, if I hear the expression, data is the new oil, again, I'm going to scream. Because people say data is a new oil, but they're not sure what that means. And I think learning to separate out a data function from a technology function um, i think is a core uh, is a core competence these days that i would emphasize and then finally i think understanding that the tech stack has changed um, dramatically um, now it's not a question of you know what is done in-house it's now a question of how do i manage a portfolio so I think taking a portfolio approach to tech stack would be my fourth recommendation. Those are the four things that I think you can build a, uh, a mindset or a framework for digital transformation around. Yeah, I think actually the, I mean, this all resonates, um, but I think uh, particularly I would highlight also the last, uh, the, your last comment, because um, right now it's not so much about, you know, buying and implementing a monolithic uh, technology that will uh, support your business end to end, uh, like, a, like an SAP ERP system or something like this. But it's really about um, plugging and playing uh, different technologies uh, together uh, via APIs and other interface uh, technologies um, to really support your business um, and yeah, uh, potentially change your business model as well, uh, enable new revenue streams, uh, etc. So I think this is a uh, very, very interesting and definitely a change uh, that has happened over the past couple of couple of years. Christian, cool. sorry to interrupt you very Thank shortly. You. Could you please uh, zoom in your screen a little bit so that the notes are seen a little bit better? Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Cool. Um, then let's maybe move on. Um, uh, Naveen, um, I uh, would love to understand um, from from you and, and your, uh, your sort of uh, history and your, uh, your, your knowledge, um, whether you currently see or notice a change, in mind, change or a shift in mindset um, in freight forwarders in embracing digital practices, digital technologies. Um, has anything changed, especially during the pandemic, because of the pandemic, despite of the pandemic? Um, would love to hear your, your view. Hi, Christian. Uh, thanks for having me today. <clears throat> so as long as the uh, shift in freight forwarders mindset uh, especially keeping in mind post pandemic, you know, so, uh, if that's the question, I would say that, uh, I won't call it a shift, but definitely I call it awareness because, uh, every freight forwarding company has been doing something, uh, to digitize their process. As Bridu said, the technology, first take of technology, uh, was being used in most of the organization, but definitely I would see, I would say that there's a lot of awareness after uh, the pandemic, especially uh, for the practices like that you have to work from home, uh, you definitely need to digitize your process. Uh, you can't be doing on a paper or on a manual 
uh, form. Moreover, you have your external stakeholders, especially your uh, vendors, your clients, the shipping lines, airlines, overseas agents. Now, things change a lot when you're not you're working remotely and you need to uh, do things the same way that you were sitting in the office and doing it. So, obviously, post pandemic, uh, there is a lot of awareness and people want to uh, learn what's happening digitally. Uh, maybe adaption uh, is subject to a lot of uh, internal and external factors. But definitely there's an awareness. Uh, secondly, I would say that every organization wants to uh, increase their sales or you know wants to increase their footprint uh, in domestic or global market. There's been a lot of shift uh, how you approach the customers, especially on the sales and marketing and your process of doing business. Uh, that has changed a lot digital because earlier we could meet clients in person or talk to them over the phone and things like that. But now it's more digitized, as you see that, especially the marketing aspect of it, uh, which was more traditional earlier. Now it's more digitized. Uh, obviously, uh, simple steps like uh, getting a customer e-delivery order, e-bill of lading, online payments, uh, sourcing rates on the shipping lines. You know, all these things have been really uh, have progressed a lot post pandemic. Uh, things were available. All these uh, technology was available very much but was not being used to the optimum. Uh, but definitely I feel there's a shift and uh, more of awareness uh, into this, yeah. Um, yeah, very, very interesting. I would definitely sign up to the, the notion that tech technology was always available, uh, but uh, sort of not uh, not adopted, so to speak. I think this is, a, you know, if you if you just look at uh, video conferencing or online webinars, uh, you know, what we're currently doing, uh, this technology has existed for a number of years, but was just not didn't see a breakthrough and we just needed this this trigger of the, the global pandemic um, and also at, at exchange we've seen this uh, significantly because uh, before uh, before the pandemic none of our customers um, approached us uh, about uh, I don't know a, a native iOS app or a native Android app uh, through which they could manage their <clears throat> container sorry container equipment or container leasing or trading transactions and as soon as techno the, the pandemic hit and everybody was starting to work from home or remotely, you know, the request like that shot through the roof. So definitely this, this mindset shift is also something that we, right. that we saw. Um, cool. Um, thanks a lot, Naveen. Um, Johnny, maybe uh, sort of looping, looping you in here, um, especially because you've, I mean, you have a, a history in, in, in technology working for, uh, working, working for uh, online businesses. Um, but you're very new to sort of the, uh, the, the world of logistics or world of uh, freight forwarding. Um, maybe uh, sort of from, from your point of view, um, what's, what's going on, what's changing in the industry, uh, sort of coming from, from the outside and taking an outside perspective? Yeah, sure, I think, uh, thanks Christian. Uh, I can echo some of the sentiment uh, that we've already spoke about here. Um, if we look at the the customers which are joining exchange and kind of where they're coming from you know they're really trying to embrace technology to to compete at a global scale and to expand their business um if we and i think um but you, you said it best uh, there's transformation and then there's embracing digital technology and i think from my perspective we have customers coming on board they're very interested to get into this new space uh, but actually embracing the technology uh, and really empowering and and, and integrating that into their daily processes can be daunting and i think what we see is and what i've gone through in the past in terms of helping customers kind of cross this bridge is really empowering them with customer facing teams that can guide them on their kind of journey to embrace this new technology i think that's super important it's super uh, powerful as, as good as software is and then how intuitive it is i think especially in this phase and then the maturity of, of kind of the digitalization especially in the shipping industry having people having training having um, um, more customer facing teams to get people across that line is super important and then really unleash the um, uh, the potential of the of, of embracing these digital technologies very very interesting very interesting and yeah i mean i, I see this of, of course also firsthand i think the level of uh, um, yeah, integration support uh, uh, trainings uh, etc that, that that we are giving especially to new customers uh, but also on an ongoing basis has just uh, gone through the roof because more and more also non-native uh, technology users are embracing technologies and they just of course need a, a little bit more um, to sort of get started and so um, I think that's also very very key um, cool and then um, Thomas uh, I haven't I haven't heard from you yet um, 
many as a, as a, as a first question to you uh, with with your your experience and your uh, your history um do you know of any let's call them old fashioned uh, or outdated processes um that are still being used today by by your fellow professionals in your network uh um in your business maybe uh, uh, directly um that would potentially shock the, the the more digitally inclined hi christian uh First of all, thank you for having me. And um, well, you know, I, I, I think I will maybe shock uh, the digital freight forwarders, you know, which are saying that uh, freight for traditional freight forwarders are operating with pencils and, and, and you know, and, and papers. So I, I haven't seen this at, at any uh, company. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think uh, every freight forwarder operating in, in sea air uh, needs to have some digital solutions. And all of them have some. I think the two, two main things what separates you know the digital efficient companies from the you know from the traditional let's say traditional companies that you know um, those traditional companies have a lot of manual uh, manual functions you know human regression functions uh, like voting, uh, data entry, communication, and so on and so forth. And of course, the second thing is they uh, their their systems are quite you know old fashioned. Uh, they they are you know not cloud based. They have no they do not have any API API connections, and uh, you know in, in in such a way they can't use out all the uh, possibilities that you know today's uh, connected connected world can provide. So so I think those two things are core. You know they 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 do everything manually without any automation, and uh, they, they their systems are outdated. Uh, yeah. But yeah. That makes makes sense. And if you think about these these core systems that are relatively outdated, um, from your perspective uh, as a pr practitioner, what's the what's the key barrier to changing them, right? To um, upgrading to a to a new system, to a more uh, modern um, and interconnected system. You know, I would say that many of those, especially small and medium freight forwarders, have developed their systems by themselves. You know, their home-based systems. And you know, when you put a lot of effort, when you put a lot of soul in it, <laughs> and uh, then it's quite hard to change. And of course, maybe they, uh, many of them, do not know all the possibilities today because they're thinking that you know you need to have a super fancy uh, ERP like Navision or you know SAP or so on and so forth but there are many other options and they I think they do not have uh, you know um, the insights into all of those options that are now provided no code options you know and uh, so it's, it's, it's I think the th main things here you know they, they are very stuck with those their, their kids developed kids and then of course they do not know everything that's happening in the world today uh, makes sense um... Cool. Now that's that's very interesting. Maybe um, moving from that because that's a, maybe a perfect segue uh, over to, uh, to 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 the others. Maybe to to Biju and uh, and Naveen. Um, from your perspective, what are some of the some of the roadblocks uh, to, uh, to 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 digital, digital transformation or adapt, adopting a new technology, uh, changing systems, etc. Um, that that you've seen? Sorry. Sorry, this this question was for me or for Biju. Uh, Biju or Naveen, uh, doesn't, doesn't matter, feel free to jump in, uh, whoever has an opinion on this. So, I mean, if you ask me, uh, to be uh, very frankly, what uh, Thomas said, that most of the com companies have the home uh, systems. So, to adapting to something outside, uh, they have to make a uh, ROI calculation, you know. If they're going to invest, what will be the ROI on the particular new system? Obviously, there's a pricing issue. Secondly, I would say that, uh, you know, there's no urgency because uh, things are going well. So uh, there's one thought to that also, as long as things are going good, why to change? So, so far it's going well. So there's no urgency to change it. And uh, most importantly, I feel that uh, overall cultural settings of any uh, demography, maybe, you know, how we operate in India, how we operate in Europe or uh, anywhere else. I mean, it, it even though it's a similar business globally, but uh, cultural setting also makes a lot of uh, difference um, and uh, yeah but maybe so, if you, mind, if you don't mind the jumping there, there. What, what do you what do you mean with sort of cultural differences how, how does that play a role here yeah for example uh, as i said that i always need to work along with my external stakeholders for example so i would see how my vendors are operating how the uh, customers are operating are they okay with uh, going fully digital if i tell them to make the bookings online to me 
rather than calling me or sending me an email uh, are they comfortable with that or not so these are all these things that i need to be aware of if i uh, push too much of technology would i be losing customers so that is one of the roadblocks mind blocks other thing roadblocks okay yeah. thank you makes a lot of sense uh, biju can you add to that or is it can you echo that yeah i can i can certainly endorse that um you know uh, i've been blessed to work with organizations that understood how to adopt digital best practices but i certainly hear firsthand accounts from industry associates and you know being embedded in the in the uh, industry working with other companies about experiences i think that you know um, a lot of the issues, particularly in implementation and modernization, if you like, come from mismatched alignment with business, not realizing that technology is a recurring expenditure. You know, the 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 capex mentality towards technology, I think, has undergone some shifting in the last years in the industry, thanks to you know an understanding about SaaS and cloud and so on. But I'm not sure that it is yet embedded that you've got to think about technology as an ongoing expense. It's a recurring expense. It's not a one-off that finishes with project and that's it. So I think that cultural misalignment is an issue. You've got some ownership and domain issues. You know, you need the cross-functional cross, uh, mindset to implementing systems because implementing a system across um, multiple functions, ops, sales, finance, especially when it's done across cultures, as uh, Thomas and Naveen referred to, it can get tricky, you know? So that's the second one I think uh, is a barrier. But I, 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 I'd endorse what Thomas and Naveen said, uh, and they both said it well, I think that legacy systems and overcoming and understanding the degree to which APIs um, and the portfolio approach I referred to earlier helps is considerable because there is a sense of, you know, um, I need to change my system when an API will achieve an objective. So I think that whole concept of um, thinking about how legacy systems are overcome, you know, Thomas referred to low code, no code, um, you know, that kind of thinking. I think those both of them referred to those legacy systems issues, and I would endorse that uh, challenge. But I'd say that the way to address that is to understand that um, it's it's a recurring uh, discipline that you need to build in organizations, and not just a capex type of project approach. Yeah, yeah, that makes it makes a lot of sense. And if we um, so, both of you mentioned um, sort of cultural factors, cultural differences, uh, etc., as one driver uh, preventing or blocking digital transformation and digital innovation. Um, are there any other um, sort of external factors, um, so factors outside of the company themselves? Uh, that might prevent um, freight forwarders from 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 going digital. Yeah, my if if you allow, I, I have few ones to add. <laughs> so basically, uh, we need to understand, you know, first of all, that uh, there the, we have few different things. You know, the big companies or medium companies are investing in digital solutions. They're doing this quite fast, and uh, yes, it's it's booming. So the the thing here is with the small companies, you know, and that those small companies usually uh usually you know if, if your operation for five or five persons i think it doesn't uh, you know it, it doesn't make sense to invest a lot of money into digital solutions you know? so i think here are two things that small companies are small and uh, and uh, they they need to understand that in order they need to look at this as as biju said as an as an investment you know it pays off if you have plans to grow and it pays off if you have uh plans to you know to, to 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 be to be in the business for upcoming decade because this this is go, going there so so uh here here uh, and another thing is uh, what i see usually what i see that you know uh, many uh, freight forwarders uh they're led by older generation and and many of them do not even have plans to be in business maybe for 10 years or they're switching uh they're switching uh, uh their you know operations for a younger generation and leaving everything for them you know <laughs> so uh so th this is also an important thing here because if you want to go digital you need to understand that you need to grow as well because only then digital solutions makes sense yeah maybe 
on that on that first notion of uh, sort of small companies, and you said, hey, if I'm just having two, three, or four people, and so uh, so digital technologies, that's all fair and square. But I question whether it really adds a lot of value. Um, I, I guess you could also take the the opposite um, sort of perspective and say, hey, especially if you're a small company, you have to leverage technology in order to be competitive um, or to have, gain your competitive advantage to be able to compete with the larger and digital um, organizations, um, or how do you how do you think about this? Or maybe well, the other. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so basically, yes, it, it 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 it's a good point, but here you know the thing here is, as Biju said, you need to look if digital solution is not uh, a one type of investment. You know, if you go the digital way. Uh, you need to go the digital way. For this, you need to have employees, uh, you know, tech employees. You need to look the processes, create new processes, uh, digitize those processes. And um, this, you know, usually, um, I don't know, but usually I think if I, if I would have a uh, freight forwarding company uh, or small freight forwarding company, of course, there's some other solutions uh, which, which can make their, you know, livings uh, better. But the fully digital, I think, for fully digital, if, if you're talking about fully digital things, for a small trade forwarder, it's, it's, I think it's too much to bear. It's, it's my opinion here. Interesting. I'd, I'd love to hear your, your view, uh, Jonathan, because um, many of our customers that, that, that join Exchange and uh, that, 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 that want to make use of our technology, they are really small companies, uh, sometimes just, just a few people. Um, and some of them, maybe that's an advantage don't actually have these legacy systems um and then yeah uh, we, we, yeah you can provide maybe, them with an ecosystem yeah i think uh, i think in theory business case could be different and, and each each company has a different business case but we've also seen small medium businesses actually really leverage our technology not only in our software to uh, compete at a global scale but also to reduce headcount meaning that they're able to enter markets find new partners um, track their containers in a more efficient way um, than they were before. So I think by embracing some of the new technology and this digital transformation, and, and specifically I'm speaking over on exchange software, of course, um, they really have opened up doors and, and we've seen a lot of good growth stories uh, come out of our existing customer base uh, without adding a bunch more complexity, but also a, a more headcount, but actually just more transactive volumes and opening new, new avenues. So I think there is a space there. Uh, and I think there's, um, depending on your user case and your business case, I think um, um, there's a big benefit to leveraging some, uh, uh, some of our and, and also digital technologies there. Yeah. Thank you. And um, maybe Naveem, if, if you look at uh, your business um, and also think about sort of uh, adoption of uh, technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are, from your point of view, from personal experience, from personal point of view, um, what are specific reasons that you wouldn't adopt, adopt certain digital tools? Uh, is there anything where you, uh, where you say, hey, this is I don't know, too complex or uh, not, not worth the effort? I mean, uh, basically for any freight forwarding companies today, uh, we uh, we have to technically uh, technologically advance ourselves uh, number one to make our processes more simple uh, for our people to work on and to give the offering to our customers but we also have to work with uh, external uh, companies exactly the uh, for example shipping lines and the airlines uh, these are where the technology has to uh, talk to each of these organizations so for example that uh, if uh, we need to source rates on the shipping line uh, or we have to go to a marketplace uh, offering where a, a marketplace uh, player is there who is giving the shipping line rates on his uh, website and we have to go and check the rates. So uh, what we have seen uh, as the mindset of most of the shipping lines as well is that they're more focused on servicing their BCO customers. So mm -hmm. wherein as a freight forwarding, uh, uh, forwarding organization, it's... Uh, it's not an enabler for me, but it's uh, more of, I mean, a competition for me. So, uh, and and most of the uh, stronger players, they just want to be disruptors, you know, uh, rather than being uh, enablers for us to participate, rather than they're trying to push the freight forwarding uh, companies uh, out. So that's been the feeling, and uh, I'm sure there's some reason behind that. Obviously, uh, even though we go digitally, we book the shipments and things like that, 
Now, there is still a lack of uh, transparency uh, on a simple matter, for example, what would be the transit time and would the shipment reach there or not? So there's definitely a lack of uh, trust and uh, there's, uh, I mean, there's no escalations. I know it really did not work. We are we practically uh, seeing those things. And you know, the st statement of the uh, US president also, he said that thousand percent increase in the ocean freight. So when you're trying to work with uh, some external companies who would say that uh, now you can avail my services, but it's going to be only digitally available to you. Uh, earlier, I could speak to somebody and get my things done, but now it's becoming, becoming even more uh, difficult. So, uh, uh, but obviously the, 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 there's a lack of trust, uh, especially if you see, uh, for example, uh, uh, custom clearances uh, in different countries. I mean, uh, I don't want to say specifically for India as well, because it takes the same amount of time uh, and the things have not changed. So the 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 the, uh, the governments or the or the organizations also, they are not adopting, adopting technology. So if we are fast in giving technology to uh, to our customers, but every player has to be equally uh, competent in adapting technologies, but which we are not seeing now. So overall uh, environment, uh, it is not still there. For us to rush into it, I would say uh, it's better to uh, watch and go. And more importantly, uh, there's some soft uh, aspects, ex exactly like the, you say, trust and transparency is uh, a factor of it, uh, which really holds us back a little bit as a trade forwarding company. And as I said, that things are really working okay the way uh, at this moment of time now. Maybe in future it would be required, but I would say. Most of the businesses are traditional businesses as uh, uh, we, we still work on a lot of thumb rule uh, aspects. What are my uh, 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 unit cost uh, and how it's a simple uh, calculation of uh, addition and multiplications. So I can still run my business with that and it's still going on. Okay, so why do rush in? So these are my points which I'm not able to put it in a proper structure, but I think I'm trying to convey what I wanted to say. That's that's one downside of uh, digital tech, right? If you rely too much on the cloud and on internet, uh, and then suddenly uh, your your Wi-Fi drops. There you go. Sorry for that. Very good recovery, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll put that in as a as a as a sticky note here as well. <laughs> um. Okay. Cool. And if you um. I think those 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 reasons all make a make a lot of sense. Um, but if you sort of relate that to specific tools that you are that you are implementing or have been thinking about implementing, um, what factors do you look at um, when deciding whether you want to wait and see and not adjust or adopt a, diff, a specific tool, or whether to go for it and use that tool? Like, what are what are key decision criteria for you as a as a, as a freight forward, as a logistics business? I mean, definitely, as I said, that uh, cost factors you know, is number one, um, where it's available at a uh, cost where I can really think that this kind of investment is uh, okay or not. That's one of the most important things. And secondly, uh, how much do we, do we really have to change our complete processes? to get into digital if it's like uh i would it won't be seamless but okay a little bit of uh, uh efforts are required then it's okay but if you have to change completely and you're like for example if you ask me to get into ai or ml and things like that and blockchain it really puts a big barrier in front of me so uh, i think the 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 progression has to be a little bit more organic for me that's what i would say good that makes that makes sense. Maybe from the from the rest of the group, uh, anything to add um, onto onto that that questions? Like, what are especially also if you uh, as a consultant or advisor, if you work with logistics businesses and they are uh, sort of facing a decision like that, um, what are key key factors or key decision criteria that you that you typically look at? Any one of you? Um, who would you like to address that question? Any one of you who has a, a view or an opinion? Well, I, I might build on what uh, Naveen said. I think that um, when it comes to um, external factors, um, one of the areas that I advise looking at is, and I think, I, I think quite frankly, the industry as a whole has struggled with this, um, is the issue of standards. Um, you know, standard setting has been an issue from 
the 80s and the 90s where we relied on customs organizations to push digitization into the forwarding community um, and then we tried to build on it and I saw that with EDI and Edifact and other aspects of standardization but then that evolved we saw it with EDI we saw that with uh, internet of things with tracking and tracing and now we're seeing with blockchain you know Naveen referred particularly to blockchain but I think that's from the fact that there is a uh, that the network effect plays out within certain domains. Companies connect with each other, form networks, but as a global industry, I think standard setting relies heavily on organizations like customs or large retailers or you know the Walmarts of this world to push an Amazon, to push a standard that then raises everybody's digitization. So I think that lack of standards or lack of a standard setting up body is something that I look at very carefully um, in, in trying to evaluate those technologies. Um, you know, so that, that is one. And then migration parts, I think, are often difficult. I think vendors that can make migration easy, because as Naveen said, um, and, and uh, both Thomas and uh, Jonathan referred to, implementation is a pain, particularly if you're a small company, because you are busy trying to make your budget and along comes somebody and wants to implement a system that is going to disrupt you not in a good way <laughs> um, and I think implementation is a problem so I suspect that people and companies and organizations that can make that migration path easy have a have a much better chance of success those are the two things that I would think I would look at from a uh, from a from a more holistic perspective I hope that helps yeah, and if, if I could add to that as well, um, from my perspective too, is before embracing any tool and any new digital tool, I think it's really important uh, from a company perspective and saying, who are my users? Who's going to be using this every day? Are they, are they trained or do they have capacity to actually embrace this? Uh, we've seen in, my, in the past, I've seen companies who are all in uh, on one level. We need to digitalize, go, go, go. But actually the day-to-day -day operations are not ready to support to handle these new processes or adopt this new technology. And I think it's a very important uh, uh, decision and um, to come before you actually embark upon getting new software in place or new processes really around who's gonna be using this, what, what do they need to be empowered with for success? Does the company and or the software give me the training and guidance needed to, to use the software and, and the process to the, to the fullest effect? So I think that's, it's a very, it seems very basic, but often overlooked um, in the buying process and kind of thought process in terms of getting your software on board. Very, very good point. Cool, thank you. Perfect, then um, I'm a little bit conscious of time. Uh, we have 12 minutes left and uh, we also want to have some, some be able to answer some, some questions. Um, maybe um, sort of dare, daring to look forward or move, move forward a little bit. Um, Biju, maybe from your point of view, um, if you look at, uh, businesses and ensuring that businesses remain aligned and uh, scale efficiency uh, efficiently. Um, what are some of the best practices that you look at um, within an organization? Like, what if, if I'm the CEO of, a, of, a, of an organization? What are some of the capabilities that I have to put in place within my org uh, to make sure that I stay up to date, I stay aligned, I stay competitive in this digital day and age? Um. Okay, so quick, some quick hit takeaways, I guess. Um, fast, rapid alignment across all functions, starting from the top all the way through to operations. So the board needs to be aligned, the CEO needs to be aligned. So anything that facilitates rapid alignment um, is, is key. Second, I think stopping to talk about disruption and start talking about rapid evolution I think is a better way to frame the mindset in organizations. Um, the biggest best practice that I would recommend to CEOs, like you said, is think about today's uh, uh, methods that involve cross-functional empowered teams rather than hierarchies. Agile, DevOps, scaled Agile. You know, Agile uh, in particular, I think, is a best practice that organizations need to develop not just for specific projects development but across the board in thinking so lean and agile i think uh, along with devops and safe i think those are those are key aspects 
Think about the tech stack as a portfolio. Uh, think about DevOps if you are a large enough organization. Um, and then have a separate um, approach to data science, analytics, and, um, you know, I heard Naveen refer to AI, but um, AI is, is around us everywhere. The question is, how does, a, how does an organization take advantage of it without having to invest in six data science people, right? So those are the four or five quick hit takeaways that I think I would, uh, I'd recommend. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and Thomas, if I, if I think about um, you and, and, and your experience, um, what's, your, what's your view on relevance and competitiveness um, of freight forwarders, regardless of adopting technology? Um, sorry if that, if that question is a little bit convoluted, but for example, um, how, do, how do organizations um, make sure irrespective of whether they have adopted their technology uh, for that or not, um, that sales and marketing efforts are aligned and stay aligned. Yeah, so uh, as I said before, you know, for a small company, usually digital solutions are just steep in price. You know? mm -hmm. so, so companies need to think of, of digital solutions as an investment, but they need to you know, do other parts of growing, you know, investing into marketing, into sales development, entering new markets. And uh, this is the way when those solutions pays off. So I have one good, you know, uh, one good example, one good success story. It's a digital company in, in, in Lithuania. It's a straight forward company in Lithuania. Uh, they, they are really investing heavily, not so heavily. They've invested around 100K in, in, uh, in a two years period. And, uh, you know, uh, the area they had received 11,000 emails per day and they reduced it to 7,000 emails per day. So only from this, from this only thing, you know, they, 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 you know, uh, they paid off the investment in three months, you know, uh, but you know, the other things that uh, they can do more sales, then they can, uh, hire, you know, more marketing sales guys who can you know do other things and they can lower uh, they they haven't uh, uh, you know uh, lowered operational managers positions but when they grow you know uh, they need lesser operational managers so so in the long run it pays off and uh, but yeah they need to com combine this with 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 marketing and growth uh, so this is the way when they when they can really reap the benefits of digital solutions Okay, but they, those are sort of then in, in general sort of uh, general principles of um, yeah growing uh, growing revenue, um, enlarging your footprint um, by investing into marketing, sales, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah, because basically, you know, I, I will add one other thing. You know, the the traditional freight forwarders are very mad on the digital freight forwarders, and. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, and and today uh, the digital freight forwarders have nothing to offer, you know, except of you know their digital solutions, and and they they are far better off. And talking from sales and marketing perspective, because they can arrive at customers, you know, doorsteps and say, you know, hey, I'm the you know digital efficient company, and those early adopters just start doing business with with them. So if you know freight forwarders would invest into you know digital solutions. And uh, we're able to market those digital solutions. You know, they could kick ass uh, digital free forwarders in a, in a year, I think, or two. You know, but but they need to combine those things. So to get the differentiators, need the differentiators, and of course, yeah. So I think it's 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 a good point here because no one likes those digital free forwarders. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, there's a uh, true. That's a that's a that's a sentiment in the market. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. I. Maybe if we have time for one 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 last question. I so just looking at my my cheat sheet here, um, and uh, we've we've listened a lot about sort of uh, barriers uh, to technology adoption, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But maybe uh, Johnny, um, if you want to uh, sort of share some, I guess, success stories of um, where uh, freight forwarders, where companies have successfully adopted uh, technology to grow their business, reduce costs, improve efficiency, et cetera, and maybe by using exchange, maybe by using other technologies. Is there anything you can share with the, the group? Yeah, just quickly in the interest of time, uh, you know, there's a variety of ways our customers have leveraged our service in the space um, from pre-planning bookings to having containers booked 
on their most commonly used routes prior to having bookings closed. Um, it really puts them in the forefront in kind of uh, in front of, uh, of where they used to be. Uh, additionally, earning better pickup credits um, by leveraging market knowledge, um, but and, uh, and also just efficiency um, by tracking all their bookings to one system has been a real game changer for, um, and again, some of our smaller customers, this has been a real game changer for them. Um, generally, we see those who have really jumped in full uh, and not only dipped into a marketplace and looked at new connections, but it really jumped in and embraced kind of the more SaaS, classic SaaS elements of, of, of our software. Um, we do see a significant increase of the transactive containers they do. So they, they're able to find more, more partners. They're able to do more containers. They're, they're able to uh, expand their business um, uh, in general. I think it's, uh, uh, and again, it's not only the small customers, but uh, larger ones too. But I think uh, really... And I guess I want to emphasize this is that um, there's one thing about looking at, at software and digitalization, and there's another thing really embracing it. And I think the customers who have gone in with two feet and jumped into the deep water and said, I'm all in, they've really seen the, the, uh, the benefits there. Makes sense. So there's no, uh, there's no tiptoeing into, into digital technologies, hoping that this will uh, change the world for you, uh, but you really have to, you have to commit. Um, I think that's a, exactly. maybe maybe a good good final word uh, sort of from 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 at least my initial set of questions um let me go into our question set here um a uh, few images of the webinar um there's one question um very interesting from ruchika um sorry i hope i pronounced that that name correctly um how is the fred forwarding industry looking at supporting and taking advantage of the startup ecosystem in various industry sectors. Um, so I guess this relates either to uh, yeah, in-house corporate, corporate ventures, uh, but also um, uh, supporting and, uh, and implementing um, other, other, other startups within the sector. Any one of you has a, has a view on this? Um, any experience, um, anything where you see, okay, this is, this is a, an industry sector or a company that has done this particularly well? Um, I think, um, Christian, the area where this, uh, where this startup ecosystem is playing out well, I mean, the, the logistics industry overall uh, has received dramatic VC funding in the last, um, you know, it's been a pattern in the last uh, eight to 10 years. Um, I think that where I'm seeing a lot of that funding in the in the venture capital area is in the area of um, uh, ancillary, what I call auxiliary systems, right? So it's companies that are providing newer platforms, um, like Exchange, for example. Um, you know, uh, there 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 are startups that are making changes around. The legacy systems, and I think that's um, that's a welcome area. I think freight forwarders are benefiting from that. Um, there are some logistics plays that involve robotics in the warehouse space, in particular, that I think that the startup ecosystem is playing out uh, pretty well. Um, there is lesser industry, there is lesser VC money in the actual freight forwarding business, but that's for the reasons that have already been touched on by Thomas and Naveen in terms of. Um, um, established network effect. It's not that easy to just become a digital forwarder. You know, all of those play out. So I think that the industry in overall is receiving a lot of VC funding, a lot of interest, supply chain and logistics in particular. And I think the areas that I referred to earlier, IoT, robotics, what I call the ancillary auxiliary systems, are, are receiving a lot of area, a lot of funding and opportunity. In in, in what I'm observing, if that helps. Yes. If we, to add to that, uh, I would say that uh, a lot of companies are looking at uh, CRM providers because these are legacy companies, freight forwarding companies. Some are 50, 60 year old companies. They have so much of data with them. Some customers have given business maybe one year before, you know, one year ago, but they're still in the system. So the CRM is really uh, is being looked into that. Moreover, of course, business uh, all the uh, business analysis uh, of data, and uh, most of the systems are repetitive. So RPAs as a plugin. Uh, so that's also being looked into that and payments and collections also uh, been adapted from the startup ecosystem. So few plugins into systems of the startup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I hope I 
got the gist of it here in, in, in the notes. Um, maybe another question, uh, question for, for Biju uh, from Ritika. Uh, what are the immediate attention areas of the business operations that need urgent focus in current times for freight forwarders to begin their journey towards digital transformation? So I guess, uh, yeah, what would be the top of mind um, issues that you want to would address uh, first and foremost? You know, I love that uh, approach uh, because what Ritika is saying is, look, I, I just want to pick at one string and I want to pick at it now. So mm -hmm. pick at it fast. I, and, that, and, you know, that's not a bad way to start. You know, you can over plan digital transformation and get nothing done. But I think that approach is is excellent. So if, if I had to pick one string and she's asked specifically about uh, operations uh, in particular. So putting aside the portal, the self-service, the integration of the customers, all of that sort of stuff, focusing on operations, I recommend targeting documentation and event tracking using software robotics. You know, there was a reference, I think Naveen made a reference to RPA, robotic process automation. But, you know, I, I saw an, uh, an ad from, um, I've done a lot of work in prior organizations with RPA to great benefit. Um, you know, the ability to move data from one application to another without human intervention, particularly in areas of documentation, which for freight forwarding is a real pain, right? Um, but documentation and event tracking, if you can include um, a, an element of robotic process automation, I think you get some big benefits very quickly. Um, as I was saying, Microsoft uh, sent me an ad um, a year ago because their RPA function now, um, Power Automate, the desktop, is available as part of Windows. Now, of course, you have to upgrade, you have to pay more if you want the enterprise version and so on. Uh, putting all that aside, there are many other RPA providers as well. So I only say this as an example because it's not necessarily a cost issue as much as the effort to implement issue. Um, and I think that's where I would start. I'd start with uh, software bots that do a whole lot of manual processing um, in, in the documentation area and event tracking area, which your customers are demanding. That's my the first string that I would pull. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Um, then Gioti asked the question, uh, can tech help address current concerns of shippers? So now thinking a little bit about your customer base, um, or what do you think is the way forward? Um, I'm not sure what, what shipper concerns are, are, are referred to here, but um, maybe one of you has a as a view on this. I think Thomas would be the right person to see. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I would like to say that, you know, the technology can solve all the shippers' needs, you know, at the moment, but, but it can't, just can't, you know. They can't somehow soften those solutions with the visibility things, with the, you know, automation things, which Biju talked about, uh, you know, with the, with the, you know, notification things is also BG, uh, BG talked about with the help of RPA and, and so on and so forth. But they can help, but they can't solve those problems. They can help. <laughs> okay, once and for all. Uh, yeah, I think, I guess uh, that also comes down to, you know, logistics and especially international freight forwarding just being an incredibly complex uh, network business, right? There's so many processes that have to happen and take place uh, across, uh, let's say, a three to three to four month period uh, to move a container um, from A to B um, through a vast number of stakeholders. Um, so it's just a, a daunting challenge to uh, really automate this uh, end to end. Uh, I would probably sign up to that. Um, and maybe one last question. I, I, I know that we're already five minutes over time, but uh, let's maybe then use this to, to, wrap, to wrap it up. Um, Rebecca asked whether you can comment on the efforts of FIATA and the DCSA, so Digital Container Shipping Association, for data standardization, because right? we also touched upon data standardization before. Will these be adopted, or are they too focused on the forwarding and carrier industries, respectively? Oh, I, I welcome them. I welcome them. I think they're highly required and they go to the heart of um, what I've been talking about a number of times in this session about standardization, industry standardization. I think any effort towards that is um, is, is is welcome. It, it, it helps uh, the evolution of um, non-legacy systems and platforms, I think. 
And will they be actually, I mean, it's good that somebody goes out and says, I design a standard, but if nobody follows it, then it's probably not a good standard. Um, but um, yeah. like, will that, will that be successful or will the industry just say, no, I, I know, Maersk says, I, I, I do my own thing uh, and either you adopt it or you, you know, you're screwed. Hard to predict. I've seen I've seen too many efforts like this. Uh, that's what my reference earlier. I've seen too many efforts where adoption gets in the uh, in the way. But uh, but then by the same token, some standards get adopted, right? Um, in, in many ways, I think if the industry can look outside for standards to bring in, for example, XML. And XML is not an industry specific standard, but adopting it for EDI between freight forwarders and carriers, I think helps. So sometimes I think taking an outward look for work that's already been done and adopting and bringing it in-house is a faster way to get uh, acceptance. So, you know, rather than reinvent the wheel, maybe it's iteration and steal it from another uh, from another uh, aspect, right? I use the word steal it loosely because the industry has a lot of specific requirements. So it's not just generally adaptable. Yeah. No, I, I don't have anything against uh, stealing stealing standards because uh, that's what, what standards, I guess, are, are for. Uh, and the more they are stolen, the better they are. Um, so uh, this is um, this is good. Um, cool. Then um, there's one last question that just come down, come, uh, came up from Antonio, um, and then we can wrap it up uh, here. Um, how do freight forward operators choose which digital technology is best for their organizations, and can they do it internally or prefer evaluating together with external experts? Um, who wants to take the advisor hat here? I think going forward, it will be more external because uh, as we already discussed that some internal systems were prevalent in the organizations, but everybody understands that uh, it has to be external because we're talking about uniformity and uh, looking at global standards. So slowly it will go external in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because also you, you as, a, as a, any individual company doesn't have the capabilities to properly evaluate and choose or? Yeah, because things are that? changing very quickly and uh, the cost factor also may be uh, getting marginalized uh, with more players into the, uh, into, the free, uh, you know, into the free and the technology uh, definitely has to bring the cost lower. I mean, that's what technology is all about. If I'm, it should be accessible. So mm -hmm. I think uh, accessibility would be there, uh, adoption would, uh, definitely uh, work and more importantly the factor of FOMO a fear of missing out that if I stick to my internal systems will I be losing out something big happening around me so I think that would really drive a lot of companies to look outside for technology rather than trying to build it on their own I, I have the same opinion here okay cool very good then um yeah thank you so much uh, for taking the time apologies for running a little bit over um Maybe, maybe I'll blame it on my Wi-Fi uh, that we had to uh, sort of uh, run, run over. Um, thanks a lot. I think this was, for me at least, uh, from my perspective, very, very uh, engaging and entertaining. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, I hope the audience uh, supports that. And um, yeah, we'll share uh, share this recording and, of course, also the document here that we uh, designed uh, together. And um, yeah, hope to hope to see and uh, talk to you all very, very soon again. Congratulations for the event. Conducted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You, everybody. Bye. Peace. Thank Bye. you so much.